Hi guys, my name is Nadia Andreeva from spinachandyoga.com and today I have a very special guest and one of my favorite teachers, Kate Stillman. And we're going to talk about Ayurveda in the Western context. So Kate, um, take a moment to introduce yourself and your practice because you're doing so many different things and I think people should definitely know what you're up to and where they can find you. Oh, great. Yeah, so... I started yogahealer.com in 2002 as an Ayurvedic practitioner and as a, as an Iyengar yoga teacher, I then went on to get certified in Anusara yoga. Uh, and I've more or less been straddling the communities, uh, the, in the West between, you know, some of the great, great yoga teachers, the whole, you know, the Western yoga movement and some of the great Ayurvedic practitioners and the whole, the whole movement and growth of Ayurveda in, in the more Western world. So, my blog talks a lot about that. I have a podcast with interviews with people in both both sides of the industry and in between where some of the holes, I think, really are for people who are interested in leaning into the evolving edge of vibrant health. That's really cool. And I do love your podcast. So guys, make sure to check that out. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about implementing Ayurveda in the Western world. And I think a lot of us, once we hear about Ayurveda, it seems very intuitive. Uh, it makes lots of sense. It ex explains why we feel or crave certain things. Uh, but then when we start implementing it, it's like, well, I don't want to be eating curries all, all the time. Um, and I, maybe I don't like rice particularly, or my body doesn't react well to beans three times a day. Um, but what we do is we tend to idealize people, uh, which we just kind of spoke about. <laughs> um, we idealize theories and traditions, and based on that, we just copy them 100% to our life. And this happens to Ayurveda as well. Breaking tradition is, in a way, looked down upon. And we just try to take what worked at some point in India in a completely different context and bring it to our own kitchen, to our own life, to a completely different context, and then kind of feel bad about failing. Um, mm. Why do you think that happens? And where do we, like, where's the break point that we go the wrong way? Mm. Yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. There's a lot of, there's a lot of levels and, um, and layers in there. And I think one is to understand that you know, a lot of the teachers of Ayurveda, the doctors of Ayurveda from India who really have brought Ayurveda to the Western world, I don't think they were at an integral level of consciousness. So they had That's a lot a of... big statement. <laughs> it's a big statement. It's a big statement. I think they had amazing access to all four states so they could be in Turiya. So they'd be in non-dual non-dual reality right so they're living from a place of like of oneness right of of that of an of what we would say um they, they're enlightened beings on one hand which is like the old enlightenment the old enlightenment was like really getting that you're not your personality like getting that like your consciousness is part of the whole consciousness and that's freaking amazing right that's awesome <laughs> and i'm not undermining that at all like we should all strive to experience that in this lifetime and to once we have help other people experience like really get beyond the limited self sense they had amazing wisdom they have amazing wisdom and far deeper wisdom than i have of of ayurveda but i'm not sure they were looking at an integral level of consciousness which is really understanding how culture and humans develop over time um, and develop through the different stages of of you know both cognitive development and inner development interpersonal development um, and that's a big thing so they weren't necessarily looking from a cultural perspective at like okay there's certain ways that we do this in India mm -hmm. and there are certain ways you know there's really a, a lot of truth that that the Western world's also figured out and how do we like take the best of both and so we got this like no this is how we do it in India so this is how we're going to do it here with not much really not much regard to that like oh you're from russia so your physiology is totally different than someone who's been in india and say you had you know 
10 generations of Russians in your ancestry who grew up in a totally different ecosystem using totally different spices and having totally different food sadhana, uh, which your physiology um, resonates with. So there's resonance, there's vibration and resonance in your physiology. Like for me, it's uh, caraway seeds. I have a grandmother from Poland and a grandfather from Russia on one side of my family, the Jewish side. And like the caraway, oh my gosh, it's like I smell it and I'm like, the home. ancestral memory of my body is like, wow, yes, you know? Um, and then on my other side, I have a, I have a French grandmother and a, and a Scandinavian grandfather. So I am like, I am such an American, I'm such a mutt. But I can tell certain, certain foods that there's this resonance of. And so those foods are going to be the easiest for me to digest and absorb. I think and that's, that's really, really different. Cool. Yeah. And so then that, that's like one part of it. And then the other part of it is looking at uh, what's happening in culture. So like you and I, we sit for work a lot. I mean, I have a standing desk. I have a walking desk. I have a seating desk. <laughs> like, like my, I do not like build cement walls with my body. You know, I don't like carry rocks on my head from one part of town to the other part of town to build the road. So my, what my body needs, um, and, and even when I was teaching quite a bit of yoga, uh, it's mostly a talking p- profession, right, where you're sitting and you're connecting and you're talking, you're moving a lot of subtle energy. Uh, that diet is going to be really, really different from the woman who's like moving rocks from one side of the village to build the road on the other side of town. And so if this isn't taken into account, if we're not taking into account like, wow, like the, the humans that we're advising have um, a postmodern level of consciousness, they're, they exercise, but other than their exercise, they're fairly sedentary. But they do spend a lot of time thinking and consuming information. They spend a lot of time, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so what are the best practices? What are the, like, what's, what is the, like, the best way, like, the best plants we have that are local to this ecosystem that they, and, and that have a resonance with their ancestry that we can use? And so what I felt like happened is a lot of the, the cons, the core concepts of Ayurveda, like, the best teachings and, and even some of the best practices, they came in, but they're all mixed up with the cultural baggage. And now we're just, like, extracting out the cultural baggage and being, like, I love the principles like hold the rice and dal, you know, unless I want Indian food, right? But like rice and dal isn't part of my Ayurveda. It's not my ancestors didn't eat rice and dal. Like I don't mind it, like, but it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for me compared to having um, like a green smoothie with local greens and invasive weeds and blah, 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 and local fruits where like, I'm like, wow, I feel the energy of this. And I can use this energy to like really do something in the world and my subtle channels are open. And, and there's a reason I think that the, if we look to at uh, why foods become popular and this is what I just started to do. I was like, why, you know, why did the green smoothie revolution happen at this point in history at this point in time? You know, it's just being very interested in that instead of saying like, that's not our Ayurvedic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I guess also not feeling guilty about letting go. Like I personally had to work through it a lot this spring when during Panchakarma, I just could not eat rice. I never eat rice. I don't like rice. So I chose to eat only lentil soup with vegetables. And for me, it was like this voice that I'm doing something wrong. I'm doing something so wrong. It's not going to have an effect. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so, and I think that happens a lot with traditions when this is one way that it's taught or it's written and you, I guess it takes courage to say, well, this is not what works necessarily for me. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, 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 and what we're looking at too, is the difference between like classical yoga and tantric yoga. Right. So in classical, it's like, it's the age of Ram. Like, here's the rules. Like, here's the boundaries. Who sets the boundaries? The tradition, the guru, the rishis of yore. They set the boundaries, you live in the boundaries. And what Tantra does is it just like, it flips the whole thing on the head and say, you're completely free. Boundaries are useful. Create your own based on what you know, based on the wisdom that you've experienced to this point and the wisdom that you're wanting to try out from those who know more than you. Use that wisdom to create your own boundaries. So now you're like, rice can stay on that side. 
because I've had the experience that it doesn't do much for me, at least not in large quantities, at least not in a mono diet type of a situation. That's really cool. So we're basically validating our own experience. Yeah, and it's important to know the rules of ROM. Like, it's important that we go through classical training. If you don't go through classical training, you don't, there's nothing to rebel against. There's no next, there's nothing to push back on. The sponda, the pulsation of, of consciousness goes one way, and then it goes the other way. And it transcends and includes where it's gone before. So it goes one way, and it uses that momentum, woo, to come back. And go even further the other way than it's ever been, and that's why it transcends because it goes even it get, and it goes further, and then from there it goes. Out. But it includes all the truths that have been learned before, and that's the basis of spiral dynamics, and it's a component of of integral theory. And it's I mean we can see it in a number of different um, Western psychological models as well. Like this is just basically how humans learn and and how we and how we develop. So. You got. You have to go. It's like it, it ties into. You have to go from pre egoic to egoic before you can transcend your ego. If you have no ego to transcend, you're just going to get confused. If you don't understand the laws of our, like the rules of our Ayurveda and why recommendations were made in a certain way, like you can't transcend them. Like you got to get the old box before you can push against it. And so I think that's really important too. Mm-hmm. Also, as part of this, is it's not just like dabble a little it's like no really get it like really try to understand the six tastes and really try to understand the rules of food combining and really try to understand meal spacing and incorporate this into your experience and do the healthy eating guidelines you know that ayurveda is you know set out um forever which is like don't meal stack don't do six small meals a day unless you're convalescing or you're like really old or you're like newborn you know like other than that like don't don't do that stuff and then from there Right. There's just a lot of being able to to listen deeply and bring in, uh, you know, the plants in your neighborhood instead of the herbs imported from India. Yeah. So do you think it's possible for somebody to, um, I guess, read to learn through the with a local teacher or through a workshop, not necessarily go through the whole training if they of their learning Ayurveda just to use it at home? Um, and then based on that, start to, I guess, create their own, in a way, boundaries. Um, where, is that, where is that thin line where you're not able to follow something just because of a weak willpower or because you're too lazy to do it um, or where it actually doesn't work for you? Do you know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. I do know what you're saying because there's well, this is it's a great question and one and it's kind of saying like it's also saying like how do we really evolve? Like how do we take the things that are hard to do but worth doing and and get to the other side of that? So that's that's what I'm hearing is like in a part of that question and then there's another part of the question is like how do I know because I've gone to the other side that this really doesn't work for me. This really isn't. Yeah. This isn't really right. What I what I keep finding, because I've developed this whole yoga health coaching certification for yoga teachers to uh, basically teach the habits of, of the, the most basic habits in their in their yoga classrooms as part of an in-depth habit change course, um, is that community is it's essential. Like if you if you aren't trying to do this in conversation with others, it's so hard to have momentum it's hard to have accountability it's how ha- it's hard to know a lot of the stuff by your you know in your own mind because you can get stuck in a little like reroute pattern in your own mind and when we have community great things can happen someone in my living ayurveda course uh last night two nights ago shared she has all these autoimmune issues and we're like three months into a nine month course and she gets dinacharya the daily rhythm she she gets the whole like you know, subtle body anatomy, energetics of Ayurveda. She gets the sort of, you know, like the three month version of Ayurveda. Like she's, she's gone through that and she knows a ton about yoga. Most people in the course do. So she has a lot of subtle body experience and she just got really strict with herself. And she's like, I'm only going to eat twice a day and see if that reduces the inflammation that's causing my, causing my autoimmune diseases. And she found within a week that her inflammation was unbelievably improved. Mm-hmm. but her emotional freaking wreck. 
And all this grief from when her mother died 30 years ago started to come out from every orifice. She's crying. She just doesn't know. And if she doesn't have anywhere to turn, what she's going to say is two meals a day doesn't work. Yeah. And then she may have chronic inflammation and her autoimmune disorders might get worse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But for her constitution, and she has Manda Agni, and there's, a, there's reasons that she ascertained for herself that Manda Agni, two meals a day might be a better idea. She's older. She's in her 60s. And that, and that resonated with her mind and her reasoning, totally resonated with her Anamaya Kosha, and her emotional body got, went through the washing machine. If she doesn't have anywhere to turn, she doesn't have support and someone to give her feedback, encouragement, someone to offer other modalities to how she can ground the you know, emotional body through a dramatic shift in her physiology, it will probably, it will probably fail. So I guess I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but it's like, I think there's just, there's so much, there's so much to habit change that has to do with culture and we have to get that. We're not objective. <laughs> We're totally influenced by like yeah. what's available in the grocery store and what's not available. And but basically before deciding whether something is not working for you or whether you're just not able to go through the process on your own and make sure that you have support. Yeah. And and this is, the, this is the coolest thing. I mean, I think, Nadia, I think this is what you and I are doing in our work right now. It's like we're creating these support communities, you know, through our, through our newsletter, through our blogging, through the interviews that we're having with other people, and then through courses where it's a lot more support from us, uh, a lot more intimate of group setting. And, and all someone has to do is say, like, you know what, this is important. I'm going to invest in this. I'm going to find a community that can contain me through the process of the next growth cycle. Uh, you know, and, and we have to just, I think, get really honest with ourselves. It's like, yeah, you're not learning Ayurveda in a culture that gets it at all. Yeah. So there's, you've got to create the culture that gets it. And if you don't have that cultural component to it, it's going to be really hard to figure out what actually works and what doesn't work. It's going to be hard to get the, the age of ROM. It's going to be hard to really figure out what the traditional rules are, why they are, and then which ones you can bend and curve. Yeah, I think that's a, such an important question to talk about because even talking about simple things, not about necessarily about Ayurveda, but for example, let's take sugar. A lot of people will try to take it out of the diet, will, won't be able to do it because of that em emotional component that will be awakened. Yeah. And they will be like, well, I do need sugar. I need just a little bit of it. And then it goes back to the old ways that it was. So I think your idea of having the support, whether it's a teacher or a community, is, um, is very timely. And it's really great that you highlighted it. Well, yeah. And I, you know, and, and I get this whole thing of like the gluten-free people and the sugar-free people and the, you know, the dairy-free people and... I, to I totally get it too, you guys. Like I've done most of it, <laughs> various points of, in time. But it's it's often like the problems are often so much bigger than that. Than the sh it's often not the sugar. It's often just that the sugar is supporting an energy cycle that's just like really up and down and up and down and up and down. And we're used to that in our mind, so our mind's kind of addicted to that pattern and all that. Whereas if we look at like, what do we really want from not having sugar? Well. Maybe we're just noticing that we're anxious and we get that there's a connection with sugar and anxiety. And maybe we just feel like we're not making the better choices and we really don't like our career <laughs> like as much as we thought we would and we have debt and like it's just like kind of a bummer, but the sugar makes us feel like it's a little bit less of a bummer. So there's like a deeper discontent and maybe we're in a cycle where we're eating late at night, we're staying out, we're watching mindless, mind-numbing TV because we really don't like our life that much and then we take out sugar. <laughs> it's like, whoa, 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 like keep the sugar, baby. <laughs> the yeah. sugar might really help you deal with like getting over the, like a job transition. And if that's the case and you start to find your dharma, the sugar is going to fall away because the sugar is cheap shit. You know, it's like, it's like crack. It's like, like give me sugar. And you get to a point where everything in your life is vibrating at another level and you put the sugar in and you're like, oh, you can't, 
swallow it and you spit it out because it doesn't have resonance anymore in your physiology. Yeah, it, it's so, so, so true that once you're ready, once you prepare the ground for a change, then the change happens so much easier. Yeah. Um, let's talk just a couple of, for somebody who is just thinking about starting Ayurveda, like very new, maybe read one or two books, maybe heard a couple of interviews. What are some Ayurvedic principles that are worth exploring or like looking yeah. into? Well, I mean, the, the, the first place to go, and this is what we do in the yoga health coaching program, is we just get the, the Dina Charya, the daily rhythms set inside out. Because that's, you know, and this is the, you know, go to bed early, wake up early, open your subtle body anatomy through breathing and movement and, you know, getting actually before that getting, time. Yeah, <laughs> hydrating, pooping, moving, eating something that's nourishing and apropos for your constitution. And, you know, getting on with your day. So, like, the most basic things. Like, to me, we get way too obsessed with our – we're narcissistic, okay? So, just as a, most people who are interested in Ayurveda, you're narcissistic. I hate to break the news, but, like, you're more – you're in it for yourself more than anything, right? And yeah. how you're going to feel. I don't you know want if it's a bad like, thing. No, it's not a bad thing. But it can be because we can get stuck in it. Yeah. And so, when Ayurveda comes into this, this sense, we're like, oh, it's, I'm special. What's my constitution? What are the, my special food lists? What are this? Oh, I can't eat that. You know, you're at the dinner party and then someone's like, I can't eat that. And it's like, oh my God, now you have that weird, you know, it's narcissistic. They're not really aware of this whole dynamic and no one really gives a shit what they can eat and what they can't eat. Mind my French. Um, if we really look at Ayurveda, it's a, it's a pull into the whole first, right? It's a pull yes, into nature first. Right, so it's not a push to the individual. The whole always comes from, the whole always comes before the one, right? Two adults make one child, right? The two is before the one. The ancestry is before the one, the unique individual. Energy works that way. The pulsation is the whole into the into the one, the ground of being into the evolutionary impulse, the impulse for something to happen. And when we, we get this, that zero, zero is the infinite contained by a line, right? An imaginary line. And the one is singular. It comes after the zero. One is the individual. It's like saying like, okay, from nothing comes something. Something we can name, we can see, we can touch, smell, taste. It's a one. And so when we get that, the first thing you want to do when you learn Ayurveda is get that zero. Like get plugged in to the current. How do you do that? to really getting serious about your daily practices because those are going to tune you right into the larger pulsation of nature's rhythms. Just, and it's the hardest thing to do. I mean, going to bed early, waking up early, opening your pranic channels, like spending some time where you're conscious of being nothing or meditation, right? You're conscious that what you are is presence without an object, right? That's all part, and that's kind of advanced, but like that's, that's all part of it. Dialing that stuff in is so much more important than like if tomatoes are on your list or not. Yeah, I, I think I completely agree with you having a consistent practice, even if it's not all at once, completely yeah. changing your day, but at least doing something. And yeah. what I found is what keeps people engaged, what keep, keeps people doing that over and over again, at least what keeps me doing it is remember why you're doing it. Yeah. Um, and when you know how exactly you want to feel, why you want to feel that way, if you want to be there for your children, if you want to be an example for your what, people who surround you, that keeps me going to my mat. It keeps me dropping nausea to my nose every morning. Mm -hmm. And that's my motivation. So I think rediscovering motivation is really important um, when creating that new routine because it can be challenging in the beginning. Yeah, and no, I mean, I did a lot of research on this with um, the with the yoga health coaching, and like, there's it's really interesting some of the research on habit change and motivation, and they're like, you can't depend, you cannot depend on motivation at all because your motivation, motivation, it, it it has its own pulsation, it goes up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. So to create a habit, say you're trying to create a habit like you want to eat a lighter dinner. And so that you can go to bed earlier so you can have more energy. So you have like, you like, you get it. You're like, I'm at 70% energy. I'm like not really showing up for my life. And, 
it's bumming me out that I'm kind of missing my own life. And I get that, like, I don't really like my job. I don't really have that much energy. But then you wake up to like, wow, my yoga teacher inspired me or so-and-so my Ayurvedic practitioner, so-and-so inspired me that like, I'm in the driver's seat and I can make some choices that will enable me to feel, you know, more energy. So there's going to be times of high motivation when you're highly motivated, like write out your food schedule for the week. Like right now, like, okay, Monday night, I'm going to have like carrot soup for dinner. And Tuesday night, I'm going to have, you know, a cucumber salad for dinner. And, and I'm going to have a lighter dinner. I'm going to eat at six o'clock. And you use that high motivation time to like go to the grocery store and like prepare some of the food so that they're easier to get then. And then there's going to be times of low motivation. So the time of low motivation is like you go to your food chart. You're like cucumber salad. You go to the fridge. There's the cucumber salad. You take it out and you eat it. Um, and the, I mean, the other big thing is like, we need, we need external reference. So we need accountability. We need community. We need someone that is helping us either stay on track or not, because if it's just between me and me, like, good luck me. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I agree with that. I think in t- personal integrity can yeah. be very helpful. Like knowing that I am an in integrity with myself can be a huge accountability thing. I, I mean, I'm not going to disagree. I agree. I'm just saying like, I always look for like, what's the, what's the easiest possible yeah. route between A and B. And if you have the support of the whole, it's like the one, it goes back to the one and the zero. Like if you make yourself more into a zero, than you are in a one, it's going to be easier. You know, it's like why it's, I, I worked so much with yoga teachers and yoga studios both in their businesses and also in with the health coaching coaches and with individuals. And one thing that we, you know, we always notice is that like class is magical. Something happens. Like personal practice is awesome and it's, it's good. It's good maintenance. But what happens in class when the group comes together, when there's a greater whole and it's like the, say there's 10 people in class, like 10 tenths. There's like one, one person, that's one tenth. There's two people, that's two tenths. The 10 tenths is different than the whole. It's different than the one that comes together with the, that it's made out of 10 tenths. That that one is greater than the sum of the parts, right? The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Where does that come from? So I, with habit change and with learning something like Ayurveda where most of us aren't going to get that much external conversation around it uh, in a supportive way that it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just going to be really hard. So paying a lot of attention to blogs like ours or podcasts like ours and, and getting yourself enrolled in a, in a group of people that are doing, and that's why I started the living Ayurveda course is just to get people that, you know, yoga teachers and, uh, and yoga students and people who were the most, those are the people that I've really found body workers that are like the most interested in Ayurveda uh, or people who've just seen a practitioner for a while and they're like, you know, I really want to, I really want to f- understand my subtle body anatomy and understand these concepts and just realize that like a lot of the way you're going to understand that is through an intimate conversation where there's some accountability for your practices. Yeah. So true. And I think we'll see more and more of this, you know, I mean, that's my hope is that like communities will wake up to like more and more of this, that it's not about the drop-in class and it's not about the drop-in workshop. It's about the, sub- it's like the high commitment yeah. community transformation. Yeah. That's something that's consistent. Yeah. And has the commitment where you're like, okay, like I'm really going to try this food combining stuff and I'm really going to try this healthy eating guidelines. And I like, I'm going to do it with, a group of people who are going to be like, you, yo, slacker. <laughs> <laughs> like, go, you're bringing us down. Because most people know that they'll do, they'll, they'll show up more for a group than they will for themselves. Yeah. That's really helpful. Well, thank you, Kate, for sharing your wisdom. And where can people find about your programs? Because you have several for yoga teachers, for people who just want to do it for themselves. Where can people learn more about it? Yeah, just go to yoga, yogahealer.com. That's the, that's the hub. Okay, and I'm going to post the link right below the video, guys, so you can just click on the link and check out Kate's website. Thank you. Yeah, Nadia, thank you, and thanks for all the work that, that you're doing uh, to really, I think, bring a lot of different voices into the conversation. It's wonderful.